So my name is Zach Semke, and I am the director of Passive House Accelerator. And on behalf of the uh, co-hosts and Tomas and the co-creators of Building Performance Interactive, welcome here this afternoon. I'm based in Seattle, so for me, it's, it's this morning. Um, the Passive House Accelerator is a catalyst for zero carbon building, and we welcome all comers to our exploration of how to slash the greenhouse gas emissions from our buildings while also making them resilient to the wild weather, extreme temperatures, and grid insecurity caused by climate change. So we're really happy that you're here. Uh, I want to take a moment to, uh, to thank the co-creators of Building Performance Interactive, Hugh Wariski and Yulia Potor of, of Partel. So Yulia, can you, can you come on and just uh, say hello? Hi, uh, hi everybody. Thanks for being here today and thanks Zach for the introduction. I have to admit that this would be a very inspirational series for the industry. It will bring together great experiences, buildings, progress, processes and people. So I'm glad to be part of this project on behalf of the Partel team uh, being involved in marketing and communication. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Yulia. Uh, there's a lot of work and, and uh, background uh, work that went into making this happen. So we're really happy that you've been doing what you've been doing to make it all come to fruition. And first of all, all of us are so excited to have Tomas O'Leary here for this, this inaugural episode. Uh, it, it, there's probably no other guest that, that can do it better to kick this off better than Tomas. So we're going to be showing a video and then also having a, a, a short conversation with Tomas and, and the co-hosts. During that time, as questions occur to you, please pose them in the chat and I'll be tracking the, the, the chat box, the, the, the whole show and uh, tracking those questions. And in order that they, those questions come in, I'll, I'll be then inviting you to, to come on screen and ask those questions. So um, please don't hesitate to, as things occur to you, to record them in the chat box. Uh, with that, it's time to introduce our co-hosts. So we have a great uh, trio of, of Passive House and high performance building experts here to uh, guide the show. Ben Adam Smith of Housing Pla House Planning Help, Hugh Wariski of Partel, and Mike Jacob of Kiss House. So with that, uh, Ben, can you take it away? Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Ben Adam Smith. And about 10 years ago, I set up the website House Planning Help. The idea being that I was going to follow my own journey. I didn't work in construction, but I decided to build my own house. So I started a podcast. We're up to over 300 podcasts now. I built my own house. I've been living in it for the last three years, Passive House enjoying all the benefits and I am well aware of how important building performance and also monitoring knowing what you're getting is which is why I was very happy to be part of this. Uh, I'm going to pass you on to Mike now. Thanks Ben. Hi everyone my name is Mike Jacob one of the co-founders of Kiss House. I've been involved in the Passive House community in the UK as an early adopter uh, since before the crash um, with an, uh, an initial attempt to become uh, with others one of the early Passive House developers in the UK and ever since have been committed to trying to scale up Passive House and that's what we're doing with Kiss House. We're bringing to market a repeatable Passive House housing product and off the back of that we're innovating Passive House and, and low energy product systems and materials that we hope to scale up and infiltrate the mainstream to, to make other houses better as well. Thanks Hugh. Okay, thanks, um, Mike. So yeah, my name is Hugh Wierski. Um, I'm a certified Passive House designer. I um, call myself a Passive House enthusiast, and I suppose I'm focused in the area of building physics. Um, I am the founder and a director at Partel. Uh, Partel is an Irish producer of sustainable, high-quality air tightness, weather sealing, uh, structural thermal breaks, and we're also quite involved in ventilation systems. We're mainly active in Europe and North America. Um, so kind of on this series, overall, I suppose we've been really keen for some time to develop this and to try, I suppose, help and accelerate the knowledge share, uh, to share different perspectives, you know, all with a view to speeding up the move to low carbon, better quality buildings. Uh, the BPI series will take us through 
best practices, lessons learned from some of the most experienced people in the industry. Um, so different systems, approaches, and different markets will all be presented. Um, so for today, I'm really, really delighted to welcome the special guest, Tomas O'Leary. Um, most of you are probably, you know, kind of familiar with Tomas to a certain extent. Um, Tomas is an accredited Passive House building certifier, a Passive House trainer, an educator for 30 years, and I suppose a, a, an influencer in this industry, um, someone who brings a really unique perspective in low energy training. Um, Tomas's journey uh, dates back to 1993 with some you know, really impactful career highlights like um, Ireland's first passive house in 2005, um, the development and acceleration of the provision of certified passive house training worldwide. Um, Tomas has worked and contributed to, you know, real genuine landmarks and a lot of firsts in different regions. Um, and just a short congrats, um, Tomas has been recognized by the UN for his outstanding work to the support of the activities of the UN Committee of Sustainable Energy is just a, a short congrats on that. So yeah, over to you, Tomas. Hopefully you can give us a, a short intro into what you're going to be showing us. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Hugh, and, and to Zach and to everybody. I, I'm blushing here, Hugh. Um, <laughs> feels like you're talking about somebody else, but it is really great to be here. And I really love what you guys are doing and I'm excited about today myself. Um, yeah, I mean, as Hugh said, you know, we've been involved in Passive House for a long time. We've actually been involved in about two million square feet of Passive House projects. And a colleague of mine um, from Moss Art will put a link into a book. We've just made a little flip book. Zach, you might be interested in that. He's going to put that in the chat towards the end so you can check out. If you want to see what two million square feet of Passive House projects it looks like, check that out. But look, um, we're here today. So our firm, Moss Art, we do design work, consulting work and education. And there's an enormous uh, skills uh, gap globally for people who are trained up in high performance building in Ireland, in the UK, in, in the US. Uh, we simply don't have enough people to build new buildings and to retrofit the existing building stock. So we have to get really creative on how we can upskill people. And um, we've had some really, really good experiences internationally, but also here in Ireland. And you're going to see those uh, today. We developed two training centres, uh, sorry, we've, we've helped to develop two training centres, one by Waterford and Wexford Education and Training Board, and another by the Leash Offaly Education and Training Board. So the video is going to show you a tour of those centres, and um, I think you'll be quite uh, impressed by what you see there, and then hopefully there'll be lots of questions and answers um, at the end about training and education and motivating people to build high performance. So thank you. Thank you, Tomas. So with that, I'm going to run the video. Please enjoy, everybody. Welcome to this video showcasing innovation in high performance building in Ireland. We're going to kick off with an overview of an excellent contractor training centre in the southeast of the country in a town called Enniscorthy. Good afternoon, my name is Michael O'Brien, I'm the Innovation and Development Manager with Waterford and Wexford Education and Training Board. We took, uh, we went, attended a number of, of uh, conferences in 2017, I believe, and it became obvious to us that there was a need for training in this high performance house area. We set about, uh, as we would normally do, uh, taking a program that already exists and rolling it out. We very quickly realized that not only was there no programs in place, there, was, there wasn't even a set of learning outcomes associated with any of the, the related high performance areas for the trades uh, or anything else really. Welcome to WWETB's NZEB Training Center in Enniscorthy in County Wexford. WWETB have assembled really what I think is the perfect training center here for contractors and for designers and specifiers to learn about high performance buildings. So any training center, of course, uh, is going to start off with a classroom, which you can see here. And um, it's very important that, you know, it's not just death by PowerPoint. Theory is very important, of course, and it's very important that we teach people not only um, how to do something, but also why to do it, okay? So when we're finished with the PowerPoint in the classroom, we'll bring it over to this bad boy here, which is our uh, little house here, where we're demonstrating 
all of the air tightness technology. Look at this for a training uh, facility. It's amazing. Different membranes, different tapes, different solutions. We've even got a fan here that we can turn on and create a 50 Pascal pressure difference between inside and outside. We close the door, obviously. And then people can actually sense, a lot of people haven't seen a blower door test and haven't sort of experienced that. So again, this is a big hit on the training programs. Let me walk you out here and we see what else we have in store. On the exterior of the house, of course, we have other features. So for example, like this wind type membrane here, we have a ventilation proficiency machine, which basically helps us to accuracy, to determine the accuracy and to calibrate ventilation equipment. We have all these full scale rigs here where people can learn how to apply tapes and membranes because air tightness and vapor control is a very important part of all our education programs. And behind me here is a very exciting hall uh, where we train people on all aspects of ventilation. So we have five different ventilation bays here where people can see um, different types of ventilation systems, right from mechanical ventilation with heat recovery down to natural ventilation with intermittent extract, ventila inter intermittent extract ventilation. Um, different types of ducts, different types of plenums and valves and so forth. So really what WWE to be have assembled here is a wonderful collection of features, technologies, practices, materials, and people leave here really truly inspired uh, to go about to build better buildings. So I hope you enjoyed that little tour. Mossart has been involved in education on high performance buildings for nearly three decades now, going way back uh, to UCD back in 1993, up to currently in 2021. We've always had a spirit of sharing our knowledge. We've been very, quite fortunate to be at the cutting edge of high performance, low carbon buildings, and we want to share that knowledge. So Mossart um, has been delivering training and education to blue collar workers and white collar workers in Ireland, where we are now, but also in the US and Canada and China. Uh, Australia and so forth and you know the, like w with the climate emergency it's important we share that knowledge and it's important that the knowledge is relevant um, to the audience to which you're delivering we're here in the contractor training facility now operated by WWETB Waterford Wexford Education Training Board and they've contracted Mossart to help them in the delivery of this training um, so the training is informed by people who are on site, who are designing buildings, uh, who are encountering problems day in, day out. So the training is very practical. It's obviously based on a really good theoretical foundation, but there's a lot of hands-on elements which complement the, theor uh, the theoretical elements as well. And it's very much up to date, very pertinent, and you know, feeds into the policy regulations that builders have to work towards in Ireland. The courses that WWETB run here are initially, uh, in, the initial intention was that they would be delivered uh, to contractors or people operating in the construction industry. What's been interesting to us is we've actually had a lot of designers and specifiers um, involved in the courses as well because you know uh, they need to know the details and materials and the application as well. But predominantly it's contractors, um, applicators, people are involved in let's say uh, masonry, masons, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, uh, you name it. And they're all coming because they realize the regulations are changing so rapidly. And if you don't uh, keep up, you're basically falling behind. And you can see some of the rigs. One of our most popular courses here in the center is how to do ventilation for NZEB. And so a lot of the, probably the most popular course is how to ventilate buildings properly. So. All types of people come in here, it's been phenomenally popular. The training center opened officially in 2018. And since that time, and bearing in mind we've had COVID as well, which has been a major disruptor, we've had in excess of 1500 learners through this uh, facility here. Um, and WWE to be pivoted as well when COVID-19 came, we moved a lot of the training successfully online, made some very practical hands-on videos as well, so people kind of weren't losing that practical feel and touch. So. You know, despite all the challenges that we faced since 2018, it's been very popular and we're really delighted uh, with the amount of people who passed through our hands here.
One of the most popular courses here at the training center by WWETB is a ventilation course. And there's a very practical reason for that. The Irish government were really, really clever. They wrote into the regulation on ventilation, which is called Part F locally. They wrote in that if you're involved in ventilation in any capacity, design, installation, commissioning or balancing, you've got to be qualified. And in order to demonstrate competency, you've got to take a training program. And WWETB were first out of the traps in developing and delivering that training program. So there's a very practical reason why the ventilation course is very popular. Now, of course, we have an expression, build tight, ventilate right. We want airtight buildings to reduce drafts and to reduce infiltration losses. But if you've got a tight building, of course, you need to have a good complementary ventilation system as well. And we've never been so conscious of that now having been through COVID-19 for the last 18 months. So in the training center here, we have various bays, we call these ventilation bays, and people are learning about different systems. Some are quite high tech, for example, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, and others are perhaps a little bit more low tech. But in every case, what we're dealing is, we're, dealing, we're teaching people how to design the ventilation system in terms of airflow rates, and fine tuning it, balancing it, and so forth. In this bay here, you can see some ducts on the ground. We weren't just being untidy here today. In this bay here, we actually teach people how to physically install the ducts and the diffusers and the valves and so forth. So again, they learn the theory, first of all, the policy, the flow rates, the design, and then they really love coming out into these bays to get their hands dirty and to get to grips with what's really involved in delivering high quality ventilation systems. Air tightness is clearly an important objective in any high performance building, and not just air tightness actually, but vapor control too. So air tightness and vapor control are an important part of all our courses, no matter who we're training here, whether it's plumbers, plasters, electricians, site supervisors, you name it, we're training all the trades here. To start off with, we use these, what we call desktop models, and we've been using these for nearly a decade now. It just gets people uh, the first experience of using the different tapes, the tools uh, and so forth, and just kind of a safe environment. We're simulating a wall here with a window and so forth, and you, you can get the impression here that um, in an hour or so, they can get a really, really good sense of the challenges and, and the difficulties, especially when you're doing it for the first time, of sealing everything up really, really correctly. So once they've finished with this desktop model, they've got their training wheels off the bike now, if you will, then we put them into a slightly bigger rig like the one I'm standing in now. And um, here we're actually lining the whole rig uh, with membrane. The trainees have gone home for the evening now, so it's nice and quiet here, but uh, tomorrow they'll be back to finish up everything. We need to make connections to the floor. We need to make a hole for the window and some other services and so forth. And I think what's important as well is to realize that it's very important that the students get to see, touch and feel all the materials that they might encounter um, out there on the building site. So whether it's grommets, whether it's different membranes, different tapes and so forth. And in the training center here, we're quite agnostic with regards to brands. So people can see different types of brands, different colors of membranes, different sort of finishes on tapes and so forth. So by the end of the training here, people are definitely leaving with a good profound understanding of the reasons to why we need airtight buildings, the dangers of not controlling vapor properly, and also they've got a good practical sense as well on how to deliver that on site. And people really have a lovely experience doing that. There are five designated centers of excellence in Ireland for NZ and retrofit. We're going to visit the second of these now, and give you a tour of what's on offer. We're at the National Construction Training Centre in the very Midlands of Ireland. This is a great facility recently set up by the Leash Offaly Education and Training Board, and they run any amount of courses here for new build and for retrofit, high performance building, with a big focus on NZEB. Now, a big part of NZEB, of course, is dealing with air tightness and vapour control. And a lot of people aren't familiar with the materials, the tapes, the membranes, the grommets, all of these type of things. So when people come here to do some training, like our two learners behind us here, it's very much hands-on experience. They're dealing with all the tricky junctions, floor to wall, wall to ceiling, wall to wall, wall to window, service penetrations, attic catches, windows, you name it. And at the end of that, they've got a really, really good hands-on sense of um, how to approach the problem, the importance of vapor control and air tightness, and how to deal with challenges such as the penetrations and junctions that I mentioned previously. So. It's a great experience and you know you can see there are several rigs here, you can have several people training at the same time. So we hope you like what you see.
we have an expression, build tight, ventilate right. And it's very clear in this training bay here, which is a ventilation training bay, but we first of all start with a good airtight envelope because it's pointless putting in a mechanical ventilation system if you don't have an airtight envelope. So the context is provided there. In this training bay here, we're dealing with a, a continuous mechanical ventilation system, CMEV, and it's connected to all the wet rooms. So we're extracting moist, humid air from bathrooms, kitchens, utility spaces, and so forth. It's all going back to a centralized fan which is exhausting that air from the house. So we end up with really good air quality and uh, no risk of mold or condensation and so forth. And we're protecting the envelope, as I said, with these vapor control layers. This is just another feature at the National Construction Training Center operated by the LOETB in the Midlands of Ireland. I think you're going to like this. In this training center, can you believe it, we've built a full scale bungalow. This is typical of the kind of construction that you might see in Ireland masonry construction with kind of poor levels of insulation. So come on around here and I'll show you what we teach the trainees to do. We can have 10 learners working on this bungalow simultaneously. We're teaching them to fix external wall insulation, um, which completely elim eliminates all the thermal bridges. They put on the, the mesh, the base coat, the finished coat, all the renders it looks really, really well. It completely transforms uh, your standard masonry construction, reduces the heat loss, gets rid of uh, mold and all sorts of problems. You teach them tricky details around the windows and there's even different finishes. So if you don't like this smooth modern plaster, you might like a wet dash like this. And again, you can see all the techniques, different insulation materials as well, not just polystyrene but also rock wool if there's any concerns about fire detailing around certain junctions. So you name it and it's going on here in terms of training, both for new build and for retrofit. And people have a really wonderful experience learning how to do this. Aside from air tightness and ventilation, we also want to get the simple things right, like roof insulation. And at the training center here, we've created this wonderful roof rig, which teaches people about every aspect of improving the energy performance of your uh, roof, such as air tightness, insulation, insulating your, your cold water tanks, lots of stuff like this. So I want to give you a quick tour and I'll explain what this is about. One of the most important rigs in the training center here is this roof rig. Um, you can see it's quite a large scale uh, of a rig and we teach people how to do every aspect of improving the energy performance of a roof. Obviously we start off with insulation to make sure that you have two layers of insulation between and across the joists. Um, we also want to make sure that the roof insulation connects with the wall insulation so we don't get condensation and mold perhaps down in the house underneath. Attic hatches are another thing, people don't seal their attic hatches and they generally don't insulate their attic hatches either so that's something else we train. And last but not least um, a lot of people nowadays have recessed lights in their upstairs rooms and of course you have a lot of heat going up through those recessed lights. So we use these little top hats here. The top hat goes above the top of the recessed light. It's taped all around with proper airtight tape and then you can put insulation directly on top of that. So it, there's a bit of breathing space in there for the light bulb so there's no problem with heat building up but you're not losing heat uh, from the house. It's a very popular rig here and um, Sometimes it's a little bit cramped and we, we teach people to take their time to do it right and to do it proper. And when you think about it, most of the heat in your house escapes up to the roof, up through the roof. So this is a really super important rig here at the National Construction Training Centre. Hi everybody. Well, we're here in the historical town of Enniscorthy, which is in the southeast of Ireland. It's a very rural location, farming landscape, quite fertile land. Um, it's a historical town as well with some very old cathedrals and a historic castle, for example. And it's a wonderful valley as well, um, serving uh, the River Slaney, which is well known um, in Ireland. So it's a really wonderful location. We're here today to look at this passive house building. So the building behind me here was designed by Moss Art Architects. It's going to be the first certified passive house office building in Ireland. Um, it's well under construction, as you can see here now. There'll be four storeys in total, roughly 5,000 square meters or 50,000 square feet. So for this locality, given the rural setting and so forth, it's quite a sizable project for this town. Um, in terms of occupancy, we can easily accommodate uh, 500 people in this building. So 
we're hoping the intention is that it will be a, a really good resource for the town in terms of a, a place to work which is comfortable and healthy, good indoor air quality and also low energy. So thinking about the structure itself and the building fabric, um, there's a big discussion going on right now about operational energy, which Passive House is really good for, and embodied energy, uh, which you know is a big discussion point now, as I said, and a lot of people are getting concerned about, well, not only what, how much energy does it take to run a building, but how much energy does it take to make the elements that go into a building. So behind me here, um, you can see the steel structure is well underway, um, and we can think about the embodied uh, carbon in steel manufacturing. To go around that then, the envelope wrap is actually going to be a timber frame or wood frame construction um, clad in OSB and the OSB boards will be taped up in terms of air tightness. Um, and then the insulation product we're using, we're quite uh, delighted with that too. We're going to use the cellulose insulation. Cellulose um, is made from recycled paper, so it's very low embodied energy, has a good thermal mass, it's got a really lot of good properties. So we're kind of optimistic that the building will be not only good in terms of energy efficiency, but also will serve as a really good prototype in terms of low embodied energy. Air tightness, as everybody knows, is a really big central plank, if you like, of passive house. And compared to normal construction, the level of air tightness that we need for passive house, depending on where you are in the world. So in Ireland, for example, the maximum number for air tightness is five, just to keep it simple, whereas passive house is 0 0.6. So you're generally talking anywhere between five and ten times tighter than conventional construction. And when you're building a big building like this, there's a fair amount of planning, forward planning, design, detailing, product selection has to be done. You've got to have good details, good products and very well executed. And the mistake a lot of people make is they actually leave all the air tightness and um, work towards the end. Then they do the blower door test and they find they're well shy of the number. So we've avoided that problem here. We've built a little rig here beside me, which we'll have a look at in a moment. And the idea of that basically is to look at the complexity of all the elements. We've got the walls, we've got roofs, we've got parapets, all the sort of junctions. And even we've got sandwich panels here of insulation and where they butt together. Um, in a normal construction site, you're not so concerned about sealing those because it's not necessary. But for Passive House, it most definitely is. So let's take a look at the experiments that we're doing here and find out um, if there's some issues that need to be resolved or not. It's very interesting to be here in front of this little pod because this idea came from a, a graduate of an education program that we're running here in Enniscorthy by WWETB. Um, that ETB, that Education and Training Board, they run a series of programs on NZEB, which stands for Nearly Zero Energy Buildings. And one of the first people to take that training it happens to be the foreman uh, on this project here. And it was really gratifying to us that um, uh, he was obviously influenced by the training he undertook and could see the importance of doing something like this pod here. In other words, not leaving it to chance till the end, but actually working out the details and materials, the application, the execution, and all of that in advance. So hats off to Michael Bennett and Sons uh, building contractors who not only had the foresight to take the training, but then could sort of connect the dots and apply the training here into this pod. So for any passive house building, no matter what the shape and size and scale, whether it's retrofit or new build, it's all about the junctions and the penetrations. And maybe a good concept is like a submarine. So we're basically building this enclosed uh, building. It'll have its own ventilation system, of course, so we'll talk about air quality maybe another time. But essentially, everything has to be buttoned up. So the, the floor has to be connected to the wall, the wall has to be connected to the roof, all the windows have to be connected to the wall, and you can't leave anything to chance. It's like having a slit in a bucket. If there's a slit in a bucket, eventually all the water will pour out. So the tricky details we're finding on this is where basically is along the roof, because the walls are actually convenient enough, um, but the, the roof junctions and where, as I say, where these panels go together, that's what we're finding uh, particularly tricky on this project. So we've ran the blower door, it's running at 50 pascal, we've a smoke pellet inside, and remember Passive House is anything between 5 and 10 times tighter than normal construction. Of course the panels themselves are airtight, there's no problem there, but where we're noticing a leak is where the panels come together. That's probably ignored for typical construction because people aren't expecting the same level of airtightness, but for Passive House, that's just not going to work. So we've come up with some interesting solutions for that. We're confident, we're confident the products are there uh, to fix it. So we're not concerned about it, 
but it's a really, really good example to see this and to show the contractors exactly what can go wrong if you don't do something like this in advance. Clearly, this isn't an official blower door test because we've got a really, really small volume here and a rather large fan. Really, what we're trying to do today is we're trying to see where are the leaks. Um, so we've got a fan here. We're going to create a pressure difference of 50 pascal. We're going to create a positive pressure so that we're effectively pushing air out of the building. And we've got, some, we've got a really good uh, trick here that we can use a smoke pellet. So if we basically turn on the fan, we put a, a pop of smoke pellet in there, it'll effectively blow the smoke out of any of the leaks. It's a bit like water spilling out of a bag and it's a great visual way of seeing the leaks. Honestly, when people see smoke coming out of gaps in, in between the membranes or gaps between the, the, the roof panels, you really can't unsee that and it's quite um, empowering and very motivating, shall I say, to try and really seal that up and do a proper job. So we're going to power up the fan now. And as we do that, you'll see the, uh, the tarpaulin here belly out. So you can sort of get a visual now on what happens when we're doing this blower door test. The fan is running at a speed now to create a 50 Pascal pressure difference between inside and outside. And as I mentioned, this is a positive pressure test. So hence, the canvas here is pushing out rather than being sucked in. In a training center like this, it's quite clear that it's all about innovation, about new materials, new applications and so forth. And we, we really would be lost without the support of the, the manufacturers and the suppliers. Um, they, they support us in terms of consumables. I mean, we go through a lot of membranes, a lot of tapes and a lot of insulation products here, as you can imagine. And also in terms of technical know-how, a lot of the products that you see in the background here, you know, they've been researched and developed over years with a lot of investment by the manufacturers. So the manufacturers actually are a really good source of knowledge, much, much deeper knowledge um, than most people have. And it's very important that the trainers are way ahead of the trainees. So the trainers actually get very good knowledge and technical support, CPD if you like, for trainers from the manufacturers and suppliers as well. And we're very grateful for that. So that's really important uh, to note if you're thinking about setting up uh, training centers. So the, the manufacturers and the suppliers help in terms of um, product supply, but also more importantly, in terms of technical support. Wow, that was uh, pretty amazing. I think I can speak for most folks in the United States that I'm just blown away by this amazing facility and the work so that is happening. Out. It's fantastic. So we are about to go into a uh, discussion between Tomas and um, our co-hosts. And I, just before we do, I wanted to remind everyone that as you have questions, please pose them in chat and I'll be tracking them and you'll have a chance to ask them during the Q&A. So with that, Ben, please take it away. Yeah, Thomas, that just is amazing. I think one of my first questions, though, is really about who is going on to the courses? Is it mainly people who are just starting out in the profession? Is this professional training? Do you have to sign yourself up? You know, maybe you could fill in some of those details. Yeah, so it's a really a wide variety of people who are taking the training. Um, you know, the original intent was that it was for contractors um, as I mentioned, but uh, we've been kind of uh, delighted with the level of interest from, you know, the professional, let's say the designers, I should say, you know, the specifiers, the uh, quantity surveyors and so forth. So both of those facilities, there are websites for those facilities and a colleague of mine is putting in a link or has just put a link in the chat for that. Thanks, Dave. Um, so um, one of the big um, struggles we have, Ben, is um, if you think about a construction project, right? Um, think about who's obliged to take training nowadays. So the bankers are obliged to have CPD training. The lawyers are obliged to have CPD training. The architects, the engineers, the quantity surveyors, everybody except the contractors. And this is a real concern of mine um, that, you know, at least how it is in Ireland and I think in the UK as well, there's no legal obligation on contractors to take continuing education. And um, the Irish government is about to bring in a, a law. It's actually in the Houses of Parliament at the moment, um, whereby every person involved in construction, even down to a one man band or a one woman band, um, has, to, has to join the Construction Industry Register of Ireland. And when you're a member of that, you're obliged to take continuing education every year. So this is going to be a, a seismic uh, game changer in Ireland. And I think it's going to be the way to come because 
you know, remember 40% of carbon emissions globally are from buildings. So, I mean, we've got really to up our game here and the best way to up our game is to get training and to get inspired. So we've got to get the contractors into the training centers. Yeah, and I'll just ask one more question. I know um, Hugh and Mike are keen to come in as well. I'll come to them in a sec. But just in terms of um, what you're doing there, you're a long way ahead of where we are in England and it sounds like the States as well. You know, so very impressive. But are your most of your buildings high performance buildings is that where most people are aiming or could someone who's building just a building regs be going through this center as well yeah 100 percent. i mean we call these centers uh it, my, my nickname for these is inspiration centers rather than training centers so um and what we mean by that is like we've had couples in their sort of 70s and 80s who are about to phase into a retrofit project you know and they're googling you know retrofit my house and you know, if you Google retrofit my house, your laptop will blow up, you know, so many choices and so many people, you know, flogging materials. So they come along to get the sort of inside story, to learn the terminology, to watch out for the key trip hazards. So that's just one example of the kind of people that we get coming uh, to the training. So some people are just looking to do a modest retrofit. Other people, we had a very big uh, household name contractor in our training center recently, and um, they're about to start construction on a very large um, passive house project, and they want you know to get up to speed and all that. So it's basically everything from the very big contractors right down to the couples who are retired and trying to improve their comfort. And like, like so you, you can sort of you can you can adopt all the principles, or you can just take a piece. That's totally up to the people who take the training. Hugh, what's your question? What's on your mind, having watched all of that? Yeah, I've got a hard one for Tomas to start. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Tomas. Something I've been thinking about, I guess, Tomas, I suppose I had the benefit of attending some of your really early um, PH introductory courses. Um, and I've been thinking about it since your approach um, back then. It was very different from the norm. You know, um, what you were promoting was completely different from what was going on in real construction. Um, mm -hmm. But I think kind of what I took from it at the time was maybe your passion and your energy kind of during it. And I'm, I guess what I'm wondering is what made you change so much um, that you kind of became, you know, somebody who could go into that room and convince so many people that that was the right thing to do? Yeah, um, gosh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a tricky one. All right. Well, I, I can I can I can I, I know exactly how I ended up in this situation. So when we first got involved in Passive House, you know, we were bringing in trainers from abroad um, English wasn't their first language and they were very, very deep in the topic, so deep in the topic that, in fact, it was a bit of um, this uh, disconnect between what they were delivering and what the learners were receiving. And I could see on the feedback forms that people are saying, you know, these people have so much knowledge, but, you know, they went off on a tangent and I sort of got lost halfway along. So I kind of decided to say, right, look. Um, maybe I should get involved in this myself. I'm actually an outsider. I'm a landscape architect. I have no basis of formal education in physics or vapor control, you know, thermal bridging, any of that kind of thing. So I actually had to go through the pain threshold, Hugh, of learning all of this stuff. So if you ever you've seen me present a class or deliver a thing, like I have gone through the same pain that the learner in front of me is going through as well. So there's a great deal of empathy there. And um, I don't take myself too seriously. I, I, my kids think I don't have any sense of humor, but I like to think I do. And, you know, we, bit it, we use humor, we use analogies, and we use a sort of passion and interest. And um, really the most gratifying thing for me, I suppose, Hugh, is to see the light bulb moment. So if somebody coming into your class, right, whose arms are crossed and they're a bit hardened, you know, they've been a contractor for 30 years, and they're wondering, you know, what's this all about? And sort of by the lunch break, you know, you have them in the palm of your hand. And they're sort of learning, leaning on every word. So I suppose you just, it's about making it simple. It's about making it engaging. And um, also, you know, don't put all the problems out front, you know, make it seem like it's kind of accessible and, you know, can do attitude. Very good. Yeah. I have a couple of other little things, but I guess one yeah. is an observation and I saw it coming up in the chat and it's really about the mock-up that you decided to do or that the contractor decided yeah. to do. And, I've seen that as a worldwide phenomenon, but only really in Passive House. Um, and mm -hmm. it doesn't always get done for whatever reason, but it just seems that it's a, the low air changes really drive that quality control check. Um, 
you know, it seems to be a, you know, a real catalyst towards better quality. Um, but maybe on the question the, and the catalyst for change, we, I know the regs have been pretty significant in pushing things more recently in Ireland and kind of in a way the regs were catching up with what people were doing. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think is the catalyst in different regions, if, you, if like Ben has said, the UK where you know, lots of people want things to move quicker? Well, if you take if you take air tightness, for example, a passive house requires 0 0.6 in Ireland, you can go you, uh, in the Republic of Ireland, you can, you know, you're required to be under five. And in the UK, believe it or not, uh, you, you're allowed to be 10, you know, so there's an, like, like I can, I can, uh, I can, I can, you know, for, travel 100 kilometers from where I'm standing now, and there's enormous variation in building regulations. Um, so I think Honestly, I think the policy people, the people who write policies have to be braver. You know, we can't stop procrastinating and leaving it for the next government, you know, to come in and, and grasp that nettle. You know, like we all have, I mean, we are living through uh, climate change. In Ireland, um, it hasn't got cold yet. It's 16 degrees today and it's almost November. This is absolutely unheard of. Um, I was at a funeral during the summer and three people, you know, just in casual conversation says, God, if it keeps getting this warm in Ireland, we're going to start need air conditioning. Can you imagine people think of now we're going to need air conditioning in Ireland? Yeah. So I like policy, pe policy, the people who write the policies, um, they've got to be braver. They've got to be bolder um, because future generations won't thank them. And I think one last thing to say, Hugh, the Irish uh, policy writers, I, I have to compliment them. They, they put the money where their mouth is and um, they really have stepped up to the plate and hopefully that could be inspiring to others as well. Thanks, Thomas. I, I could probably stay asking you questions, but I'd say Mike has a few things he'd like to pick up. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I do have one question for you, Thomas, about embodied carbon, but I'll come to that in a, in a minute. I just first yeah. want to congratulate you. And Zach and everybody involved in putting this together, it's it's a really inspirational and exciting platform to, to be part of um, at a moment when I think the, the kind of open heartedness that you've demonstrated and the knowledge sharing and the democratization of Passive House, demystifying Passive House and showing the love essentially, you know, and we spoke about in, in the, you know, in the session, in, in the, the few minutes before this session started, we spoke about the power of imagination. And you know all of the stuff that we saw in that film, all of the stuff that you've been doing for the last three decades, is a product of your imagination, you know. And it, and it is, and, and your your infectious spirit, your magnetism, you're, you're pulling people, you know, towards you, and um, and and demonstrating best practice and spreading knowledge, which is improving standards in the industry, which is really something to be That's applauded. Very kind. Thank you. I mean that, and I and I think you know addressing what is essentially you know one of there there are many gaps. There's a performance gap, you know, there's a skills gap, there's an implementation gap, you know. But but addressing that weak link in the chain, it doesn't matter how good something is on paper, how great uh, the products are that have been specified, or how clever a design is. It always comes down to a guy or girl on site or or a facility somewhere that's got to physically create something that represents that design or uses those products. And it's the weak link in the chain is how those things are actually installed. Put together how they're handled you know a good product installed badly is a waste of time and money and and you're addressing that um, that skills gap and also i guess there's an issue of um uh, the kind of the pride that people feel in the work that they do which you're addressing as well which, all of which is i thoroughly congratulate you it's really inspirational oh, and the so question much. question was um it's, it relates to um the multi-story um, steel frame building that where, where you mentioned embodied carbon um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you whether it's a, a, a tricky question or not. I don't know, but is there a cost driver uh, underlying the uh, choice to use a steel frame on that structure, or did it actually turn out to be better in the calculations or in the analysis anyway? Um, so I suppose big picture, first of all, Mike, I mean, we've been involved in Passive House for a very long time. And I can see like, you know, in the last 18 months or two years, the discussion has shifted very, very, very quickly to embodied energy. Obviously, it's been something we've been very conscious of for a long time. But now we're basically really embracing that. And I see we, the whole Passive House, passive house community, excuse me. So um, for that particular project, you know, you're on site, you're under pressure, there's a supply of materials globally, you know, COVID hasn't helped in that regard. We would have loved to have glue lamb beams and we did look into that for a very long time. There was availability issues and also concern issues about, you know, building regulations and so forth. So we went with the steel uh, structure, which is there. Um, 
the, the entire skin of the building, the thermal envelope, if you will, uh, is timber frame, which is very unusual in Ireland. So four story timber frame building, OSB for air tightness taped up, cellulose insulation. So I'd be lying to you, Mike, if I said we've done a really detailed, you know, full life cycle cost analysis. We're, we're, we're actually undertaking that study now. The windows are made in the, in the, in the town, interestingly enough, uh, which is kind of unusual. So triple A's passive house windows made locally. So um, I suppose full disclosure, we're really, this is our first toe in the water of merging passive house with low embodied energy. And it's been very exciting so far, but it's not without its challenges. Zach, do you want to step in now? Are you, um, have you got any good questions there? Yep, yes, we sure do. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's, let's launch into those. Um, our first question, and I think Bob, you had a couple of them, is from Bob Hale. So Bob, if you are on the call still, would you unmute yourself? And if you feel comfortable, come on camera and, and ask your questions. Thank you. It's a bit early here and dark, so I will not turn on the video, but thanks for that invitation. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> it's um, a question about the galvanized steel, or what is the steel, the metal material for the framing of that uh, structure, the four-story structure? Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's normal steel that's used in construction. The reason it's, it's painted white is for fire protection. Um, so that's basically a, a, a measure, you know, it's required by regulations here to have um, any elements of the structure which are, you know, structural to be uh, treated. So it's basically what you're looking at, that white colouring there is an intumescent paint. Um, I'm not an expert in that particular aspect of, the, of that detailing. I'm not a fire expert by any means, but uh, what you're looking at there is fire protection. Okay. protection. Long uh, Sorry, Bob, that you're you're breaking up there. If you wouldn't mind following up in chat, we'll make sure that you, the rest of your question gets asked there. So uh, I think you. the internet connection, internet's a little bit spotty there. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. thanks okay. Bob. Yeah. So let's let's move on. Uh, ben, I know that it wasn't really a question; it was more of a comment. Do you do you want to pose it or? Should we move on to the next question? Ben Is Larson. That me? Yeah, okay. <laughs> ben Larson, go ahead. I had a... Maybe you can hear me better now. Um, yeah, I have more of a comment that uh, in the United States, we don't really train our contractors to some of the comments that have been made before. Um, we only train the contractors that are involved in asbestos abatement and if you're a crane operator. And there's a huge chasm of education that needs to happen here for contractors. Um, and I just would really, I don't know how we start that. Uh, how did you guys start? Um, it, it, it's thanks, Ben, for that. It's a really, really important question. You know, it, it isn't in the mindset for contractors uh, to take uh, training. It just isn't. They're busy. They're on site, and they don't. They don't. They would regard taking a day off uh, training as literally losing a kind of a day's wages. We've got to make sure that their employers are motivated um, to pay people to go off. You know, and, and pay them while they're off training. One of the things I would say is. Um, there's been research, some research done which basically been, uh, correlates uh, education with productivity. And by productivity, we mean increased pro uh, profitability. So, for example, I'm seeing projects where contractors aren't trained and they're ripping off membranes, they're ripping off tapes, they're running around chasing their tails and because they basically didn't get it right the first time, making what I would call rudimentary mistakes. Whereas if they had had a little bit of education uh, in the first case, and it's really, you know, it, it, it's, we just call it sort of attitudinal shift, really. I mean, they have the skills much more than I would have. Um, so it's really about efficiencies, about productivity, about cost avoidance, also about positioning yourself in the market. You know, it's a very competitive market. And um, if you can position yourself as somebody who does high performance, you know, low carbon, passive house and all the rest of it, that instills a sense of confidence in your clients as well. But it's a global problem, Ben. You put your finger on something really, really, really important here. How do we actually create the spirit among the construction community that, um, that they should embark on this kind of 
learning exercise and um, it's not easy but if you can get them in there and if you can get people that's what we have found just get the early people in they start to talk about it also one last thing Ben um, we give people a digital badge right so if they take the training they actually get something that they can have on their Facebook site they can put on their van they can put on their email signature and if you click that little badge a digital badge their CV comes up what they learned where they studied you know how and it's you know we, we we've seen people actually showing that off with pride you know they're in the car park and you're saying have you seen my badge you know so um it, it's going to be a long road and it's going to take time but once you get going we have found the traction really builds in thanks ben great thank you so uh michelle you're up next yes hi uh, my name is michael i'm with uh, national research council canada doesn't matter uh, my question actually has been answered. Thanks, Thomas. I was asking about if LCA analysis was, was done, but uh, in one of the answers to, to Mike, you already mentioned that you are working on it right now. Yeah. But uh, the follow-up on that, actually, do you see, you know, with uh, regards on carbon, uh, embodied carbon, do you see kind of shift or, or switch in materials that you uh, are going to use from now on versus what you have been using till today, for example? Yeah, I mean... Uh... Every time I look at a piece of wood now, Mikhail, you know, I, when I look at wood, you know, I look at that and say, wow, that's solid carbon. You know, it, wood is like something like 49% carbon and 50% oxygen. Carbon, yeah. Yeah. You know, you could actually eat it if you were really, really sort of, you know, in a bad way for food. Um, so um, we like wood uh, in our office, generally speaking. And, uh, and, so, and we also like wood-based products. Um, Plant-based insulation materials, for example, cellulose, they actually behave very well if they get a little bit moist, you know, for example. So if there is a bit of moisture in the envelope, which there shouldn't be, but if there is, um, they can still retain um, much of their insulation properties. And, you know, I, I think, um, like, for example, around the world, there are people burning wood to make energy, um, which to my mind is just like completely bonkers. You could actually mill that wood, chop it up into tiny pieces, make insulation out of it and stick it on the side of a building, you know? So we should stop burning wood and we should stop, we should start making insulation yeah. from it. Uh, this is something I've been trying to kind of scream about. <laughs> I don't sure, know if it's sure. your boat or yeah. not. But. Biomass is not great, not great source of heat. That's, I, I agree with that, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, if you grow a tree, don't chop it down and burn it, you know, make something out of it. So it's kind of, you know, uh, put, you know, you know, so, so basically, you are confirming that you are not using extruded polystyrene anymore, but you're switching to to cellulose. And, and where we can, where we can. I mean, I don't. You know, it's 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 not easy. We're in a period of transition, sure. and um, you know, but but in all the courses that we're delivering, we're always talking about this. And we want people to think about it, and at least it, most people haven't given this any thought before. And uh, so, what we're, you know, we're just trying to get the discussion going on that. But I really appreciate body it. Carbon can be up to fifty percent, you know, of, of the whole carbon Huge. footprint. One hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Thank you for your question. Good to see you. Great. Thank you. So we're going to take a quick pause here and uh, have some comments from the, the co-hosts and then we'll, we'll I'll be making a few event announcements, but we have a bunch more questions. So assuming that Tomas and, and the co-hosts are available, once we kind of close the formal one hour session in a few minutes, we'll then extend and continue on into questions and answers. Happy to do that, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So um, let's, let's move into the, some thoughts from the co-hosts. Well, I'll kick off and uh, I just think it's fantastic what you're doing. I've still got some other questions up my sleeve, but I'll, I'll keep them there for now. And, and one of them will be how we continue this work and how easy it is in inverted commas to um, get this training to people and whether if you build them, they will come. You know, if you've got more of these centers around the world, um, I, well, let's hope that they're, they're on the way that then they fill up and we can expand more quickly as everything that uh, Passive House Accelerator is doing. So well done, Tomas. Keep up the good yeah. work. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say that it's a very interesting moment in time. You know, yesterday we saw the launch of Built by Nature, um, a, a, a European-wide, to begin with, organisation to accelerate uh, the use of timber in the built environment. Um, and, and, you know, here we are today, um, the first episode of, of, of a series. Um, 
promoting best practice um, and sharing knowledge. It, it's just a very interesting moment in time as, as this momentum starts to build. But as, as clearly has been demonstrated, you know, there's been decades of work put into this already and many more decades to come. You know, this is a, this is a long journey. It's a long road. It's good to be part of it. Thanks, Mike. I guess from, from my side, I guess the, the training side of things is really interesting and the, I guess where that can go. And I guess we're all hopeful that that will start to be brought back towards the colleges that train both the trades and the, I suppose the professionals as well, that they all get an experience with, um, you know, with these necessary skills and how they, the next generation brings them into construction. Thanks, you. Appreciate that. Awesome. Nice. So with that, our next question is from Larry Meyer. If you're still, Larry, are you still on the call? If you are, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, uh, this is Larry. Uh, my background is about 18 years doing commercial industrial performance contracting. And the way those projects worked was how we could finance them. And I find many, homeowners approach the builder, but the builder does not how, know how to work with the finance company. Uh, um, and so my question was around how the builder training can be set up so that the builder knows how to document what goes into the building in sort of an as-built manual with pictures. Secondly, in that critical 60 to 90 days before its construction, to be able to demonstrate to the lender with a pre-appraisal on this project, which would include cost of construction comparables and the energy savings in the income category. We also put on training for realtors because they don't know the difference between uh, a code house and a high performance house. And without their knowledge, we see these high performance houses getting sold uh, and by realtors that don't understand the difference in construction cost or performance. So we find it, it's a really a critical element. In my area in North Dakota, Minnesota, we've been doing cross training classes two to three days once a year for the last six years where we bring in the builder, then we have bring in the realtor, then we bring in the appraiser, and then we bring in the lender. And we're just starting to get some traction after that period of time, which goes to the main point, how do you finance these projects? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's, 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 a, it's a tricky one. Thanks for that. Um, so just on the first issue first, I mean, you know, uh, cataloging the as-built scenarios. So one of the main reasons that we encourage people to have their passive house project certified um, is the, the certification process requires you to document uh, the as-built details, all the thermal bridges, all the air tightness junctions, the window installation, ventilation systems, and the ventilation system has been commissioned and balanced and all of that. So baked into uh, the, the process is this kind of, you know, um, recording and documentation. So that's, you know, if you go passive house, you sort of get that, you know, as part of the process. On your question about, you know, financiers and realtors, um, on our side of the pond here, and it, it, it's, it's, you know, this is, I think, going to be a, glo a global movement. Um, essentially, the banks are now clambering over each other to offer lower mortgages for higher performance buildings because they see it as a good risk. Um, they essentially uh, see that, you know, well, if I invest, you know, a couple of hundred, if I loan a couple of hundred thousand dollars, to this family and they're building a building which is of high performance you know the, the the chances are they're going to have more disposable income to pay back the mortgage because they'll be spending less on energy so i see it, it so honestly three or four years ago i would have been maybe a little bit cynical on the bank's knowledge level and awareness and appreciation here but at least we're seeing the national banks in ireland and the same in the uk i see something in the chat there about that that they are really starting to get this and they need to anyway because um you know they need to invest in and they need to demonstrate um you know uh, smart investment of, of resources so um 
So I appreciate that's not the case everywhere. And uh, in, you know, maybe in your part of the world, that's more, more challenging. But we definitely have to educate the realtors, the, the you know, the, the, the financiers and the bankers. But, you know, that change is coming rapidly. We're seeing it here already. Well, uh, the one follow-up comment is that uh, in America, the financial institutions are all independent. Very little mm -hmm. national direction is happening. Yeah. And there's a large disparity in energy costs. Uh, I'm in an area where energy costs are one third of where they are in the UK and Germany. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's important to, in the as-built manual to demonstrate the energy efficiency and the comfort and yeah. the health um, uh, to because to stand alone on the energy savings, the banker yeah. is going to turn up his nose. Yeah, and just uh, so two very quick responses there, Zach, if I may. When I said national banks, I don't mean government banks. They're just like, you know, the city bank or whatever, like they're on every high street in every town in Ireland. That's what I meant there. Um, and secondly, I think, you know, COVID the tragedy that it is has actually been quite helpful insofar as now people are talking about air changes per hour and filters and all of that kind of thing. And of course, I wouldn't wish, I mean, obviously we all wish COVID had never <laughs> made an appearance, but you know, people are definitely more attuned now to comfort. And also people have actually had to work from home for a year and a half and, and they're realizing, actually, my home is not that comfortable in the winter. Um, you know, I'm normally out at work in my nice, cozy office and now at home all day and I'm actually feeling the chill. So, um, in, you know, we, every, every cloud, I suppose, has a silver lining. And for sure, um, uh, we, we've got to sell not just the energy benefits, but the health and the comfort as well. Thank you very much for that. Great. Thanks, Tomas. So up next is Adam McLaughlin. Hi there. Yeah, um, I just kind of had a f almost like a bit of a follow on question um, regarding the cost. Uh, one of the main kind of barriers we find with clients is this kind of, I guess, perception that high performance buildings is a huge cost premium. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering if there's any kind of guidelines or rule of thumb over, you know, a, a, say a new build house built to passive house levels versus uh, yeah. code, code minimum requirements, just even. Great, good question, Adam. And you know, it, 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 I'm sorry to start off uh, the, the, the answer with it depends, but it does depend. Yeah. And um, so, for example, uh, in Ireland, where the bidding regulations now have, have advanced very significantly over the last you know, two to three years, there's mm -hmm. almost no difference. Quite honestly, there's very, very little difference um, in the effort required for bidding regulations and the effort required for passive house. I mean, if you're very like in some projects we're doing in Ireland, we're actually taking out wet heating systems, right? If you can build to the passive house standard, you can actually use the ventilation air to transport the heat that you need around the building. In one particular project I have in mind, we've saved 900,000 euro, uh, which is about maybe 1.2 or 1.3 million dollars on taking out radiators. So there's a kind of a there's an example of where if you actually push the envelope far enough you can actually bring about real savings. One other thing I would say, um, in the UK, a study was done recently, um, but, and the name escapes me now, and I'm sorry to, uh, maybe we can follow up, Zach, on another call on this, but essentially the rule of thumb was, oh, you know, 10 to 15% extra for passive house. But in actual fact, um, uh, the, these consultants, on, I've just gone blank on them now, but they did some okay. research, maybe knows, somebody knows the study, actually the, the cost differential in the UK is only around 0.9% or 1%, which actually, re, you know, surprised me too, to be honest, right? But what we say to designers is, look, keep the building simple, keep the junction simple, keep the like form factor. One of the biggest drivers on cost is the form factor of the building. If you can keep the building sort of, you know, without kind of sprawling, you know, um, bays and recesses and all the rest of the thing, you know, simplicity, you know, adds to a lot of cost efficiency and training coming back to that, by the way, a lot of contractors, Zach, who are pricing passive house projects, if they've never done passive house before, they're going to put on, um, you know, a 10% fear factor. Oh, I don't know about this passive house air tightness. What we've done on projects is we've insisted if you want to train, if you want to bid on this project, you have to take training. And they come and take the training and they say, actually, you know what, this is not so bad. And then maybe the only, so maybe the 10% the fear factor is gone 
after that. And um, so, you know, keep it simple, train the contractors and, um, you know, uh, keep, you know, design out bling. You know, we don't, we've enough bling in the world. Thanks very much. We just got to focus now on envelope. Yeah. Thank you. That's thank a, you. Thanks, Adam. That's, that's a great pull quote, Tom, uh, Tomas. We have enough bling in the world. I, and on the, on the cost, piece as well I, uh, for for multifamily buildings it can be zero um it, we, yeah, there, yeah. we have it yeah in pen, right in, in cheaper Penn, we in data from pennsylvania shows that it's actually that, that it's cheaper in massachusetts there's a cost premium of one to two percent which is essentially the cost premium of uh the ventilation system which is making the these spaces healthy in the first place so yeah. i mean you know if, if we want to forego yeah. Health, it'll be cheaper, but nobody's going to do that. So uh, it kind of annoys me, Zach. Just one last thing on that: nobody has ever questioned to me the price of a granite countertop. Right. right. What's the payback? Right. Or what's the payback on my on my Land Rover parked outside? You know, what's the payback on you know a television? You know, that's big enough. You know, for whatever. Like the thing is, there's a prejudice here, and it comes back to this, Zach. People do not value you know, uh, energy saving measures. They just see that as kind of, you know, a burden. Why would I pay for that? You ask your kids, hey kids, what's more important? A granite countertop or really good comfort and indoor air quality, end of discussion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've, we've got a sort of man up here or, <laughs> and it is normally probably with men, let's be honest. You know, we've, we've got to actually sort of face facts here. You know, we've got, you know, we've got to place, place value on what's valuable. Well said, thanks Tomas. Okay, so next up is Woman Ant. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> Woman said yeah. Woman <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> love it. Well, well said, Shannon. Uh, next up is Andrew Doherty. Andrew, are you still? I think we may have lost Andrew. Okay, so um, after Andrew, we have Enrique. Enrique, that's a lovely name. Yes, Enrique, are you still on the call? Yep. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, Thomas, uh, I am with uh, Vermont Passive House here. You are very familiar with this area because you have Wonderful. been teaching here many of the certified Passive House uh, designers who are probably your students. So um, uh, we, we are right now in the process of developing a workforce uh, a training program. Mm -hmm. And the legislature has assigned already $2 million for that. So I wonder if, uh, it, uh, if you would be interested in doing some kind of coaching to that because I, yeah, nobody yeah. is, uh, is uh, prepared here for really training. And part of the curriculum is going to be building science and uh, all this, I mean, all what you're doing there in Ireland. Yeah. So uh, I wonder if uh, there could be any possibility for you to do some uh, kind of coaching into this program. Yeah, absolutely, Enrique. I, I think I said at the introduction there, um, we were uh, heavily involved in training centers in the Bronx, in Beijing, in China, in Melbourne, Australia, um, you know, um, several locations in Ireland. And, you know, every time we do a new training center, it gets better because you learn from the mistakes in the past, if you know what I mean. And um, for example, just one, uh, one, one thing is, you know, the, the air tightness house that we showed you in the video there, we're now actually starting to consider, wouldn't it be clever actually if that was one of the classrooms in the training center? So it's not just a thing that you're walking around and enjoy for a half an hour, but it's, you're actually deeply immersed in that for your whole day. So um, yeah, I mean, in terms of curriculum development, we can help with that. Uh, you know, everything has to have a strong foundation in building physics. And um, so, yeah, I mean, um, Dave, if, if my colleague Dave is on the line here, you can pop my email into the chat and you can drop me a line or you can contact me through Zach. But yeah, look, we need, we need hundreds, if not thousands of these uh, inspiration centers right across the world. Every decent sized town should have one. They don't take a lot of space. And, um, and you know, it, it'd be a great way of sort of moving the market. So well done Enrique and the very best to look on your project. Yeah, thank you. We have uh, spent the last four months already developing a curriculum. I can share it with you, but yeah, it's, uh, it looks very it. nice on the paper. On the paper, but I don't think we are prepared to do it in, well, one, in one, action. One, one more thing I should say, Enrique, and this is really important, Zach. I think generally for anybody listening in, um, you've got to make the training uh, locally relevant, right? So, for example, the construction system, the climate. 
you know, uh, the availability of materials, um, you know, um, cold climate, humid climate, masonry construction, stick frame construction, whatever it is, is it new build, is it retrofit, is it commercial, is it residential? Um, you know, you've, you've really got to, uh, to, to nail all of, all of that down. And then you'll have a queue at the door because people will say, look, this is relevant. Almost like Enrique, when I say, when they walk into the training center, they should see something that is of that locale, you know, and they say, wow, okay, this is going to be a cool place uh, for me uh, to learn stuff. So I'm happy to, happy to chat with you about that some other time. Great. That's the relevance to it uh, locally here. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And Mika, yeah, congratulations. Well done. That's good. Thank you much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Enrique. Okay, it looks like we have one last question from Jay Leppel. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And then I think at the after we do that, I'll invite co-hosts to to uh, um, maybe say a, a parting, uh, share a parting thought. Um, if I missed your question, please post it in chat, and I'll make sure we get to it. But I think Jay is our last one. So Jay, please ask your question. Hey, uh, Jay Lepley from Bensonwood Homes in the Northeast here in the U.S. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, just, had a, just had a quick question. Uh, well, a couple part question is the, I, I visited the U.K., um, toured some factories, but I, we mostly toured offsite construction. I'm wondering the percentage of offsite factories in the U.K. and then leading part of that question is great, great training presentation. Just wondering, do you think all the applications that you bring in this training apply to the offsite construction field too? Yeah, really good question, Jay. So um, don't have a straight answer for you on proportions, but what I can say is, um, like we have a crisis in, in, in workforce in you know, availability of skilled labor and, you know, Irish parents and British parents and probably US parents as well, they don't really want little Johnny or little Mary going into construction anymore because they have the perception that it's tough work. You're out in, 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 in poor weather. Uh, maybe it's not a secure job, you know, with the recycles and recession and so forth. Um, we've got a problem with, with fewer and fewer people getting into construction. And that's why we've got to go off site. We've got to uh, embrace modern methods of construction. Um, I mean, look at look at car manufacturing, look at mobile phone manufacturing and all of that. And still, uh, you know, if, if in, in the majority of cases for construction, it's still sort of out, you know, with the hammer or the trowel or whatever it is. So I, I, I can I can tell you that, the, you know, the, the proportion of offsite uh, manufacturing in Ireland, um, I guess in, in England as well, is, is ramping up very significantly. And there's fewer and fewer people going into a field or a site you know, with a bag of cement and a concrete block on the shoulder or a, you know, bale of four by twos and a, and a bag of hammers, bag of nails, bag of, a bag of nails. So that's that. And you ask, you know, um, does this training and education apply uh, to offsite, you know, manufacturing? It absolutely does. Um, you know, again, like people are generally working towards a regulation. So for example, if regulation allows you to have five air changes, people are sort of in or around that number. And um, of course, if you want really high performance, high comfort and good air quality, you've got to get that number down. And um, so I would say to you, the, the people who are involved in offsite are definitely better positioned because, because it's manufactured, there's greater levels of accuracy, there's less waste and so forth. So they def definitely the standard, you know, is just is higher, it's baked in already. Uh, but I mean, we've all got lots to learn, myself included. Um, and I'll give you one example on that, if, if I may, Jay. I was at an event um, a few days ago, as uh, Zach, you'd be interested in this. And um, there was about 30 or 40 retrofit contractors in the room. And I held up some vacuum insulation. Now, if you haven't heard of vacuum insulation, it's brilliant for retrofitting floors. It saves you digging out floors and concrete and all of that kind of stuff. And I just asked for a show of hands. I said, look, guys, let's be, just be honest with me here today. How many people in the room are aware of or even heard of vacuum insulated panels? And only about three or four hands out of 40 hands went up. And I was really, I, I was, you know, I was quite surprised at that. So basically, um, there's new products, there's new materials, 
uh, you know, and Partel have been very involved in that in sort of in the innovation of, of products and materials. And again, to give a shout out to Hugh and his team there for that. Um, so even the people who are involved in modern methods of construction, offsite construction, you know, they can benefit from that as well. So long winded answer. Sorry, Jay. Hopefully that's OK for you. Oh, that is I'm great. A and I, I appreciate it. And, the, you know, the, we're, so we're about a 30 to 50 project a year company that goes anywhere from residential to to commercial with high performance and not all of them are passive house sure. but what we do try to get is all passive house air tightness in all of our buildings so but we at the end of our project of two weeks say two to four weeks we lower door test every single one of our homes and try to get that and what's inspiring to me is just the training element of it because we have probably 30 guys in the field and i mean in the field both in the shop and in the field Sure. And so it's very inspiring to see the training and how those methods can be, uh, you know, taught and in, in a classroom training almost. And uh, mm -hmm. so I look forward to more and it's very inspiring everything that you guys are doing. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks so much, Jay. Have a great day. On that subject, Jay, I guess some of the follow up for the for these series will be focused on some of the offsite manufacturers in both the UK and Ireland that are delivering, um, you know, 0.6 on a regular basis. So you'll get a good insight into that. Um, and I would say on the training side of things for factories, what it tends to be is more about systems and, you know, maybe working with somebody, uh, a manufacturer. And it, it, it's often the case that um, things can become bespoke for factories, which can be a big help towards, you know, achieving air tightness on a more regular basis. So that could mean off standard membranes or different things like that that suit a fabrication process. But in Ireland, all manufacturing of offsite timber frame is now closed panel. Um, it doesn't happen anymore as an open stud. The UK, I would say, you know, Mike knows this better than than most, but it's on a path. Um, and it, it, you know, it's changing kind of slowly to that, but that that is probably the the overall direction as to where it will go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great to hear. Thanks, guys. Great. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Tomas. So, uh, Hugh and and Ben and Mike, what what uh, what final thoughts do you have to share with everybody? Well, okay. I'll kick off. Um, I, I think one of the things that's underlined for me is some sort of qualification. Uh, in I don't know where these apply, but certainly in the UK, you don't need any qualifications whatsoever to become a builder. So I can go out there tomorrow, start up my building firm, and and I'm in. So um, this is you know this sort of training is fantastic. And the other thing that it's made me think about, and Tomas mentioned it right at the end. You know the regulations. Unfortunately, people will always build to what is the lowest regulation if they possibly can. So we need to increase those, and also. We as clients, customers, people buying buildings need to demand more. So those are the key takeaways that I've had. Uh, what about you, Mike? Yeah, um, firstly, I just want to thank everybody who's still here in the, in this extended session. So it's great that so many people have, have remained. Um, and what a great session. I think the two, the two points really that I just wanted to make, one was in relation to the last question from Jay about offsite. Um, I think yeah, yes, there is a certainly there's a there's a there's a trend towards offsites. Um, uh, you know, be that modular, panelized, or, or, or looking ahead towards the more component-based supply chain and sub-assemblies and so on. All of that stuff still has to be brought together on site. So it doesn't matter what quality control there is in a factory and how and how good that is. Good point. Somebody still has to connect a panel to a panel or a module to a module or install a component correctly. That still has to happen. That issue doesn't go away. So everything that Thomas is doing is directly transferable. And if, if anything, the need is greater, I would say. Um, uh, so, uh, so that was just my observation on that. And then the other point that stood out to me was in res with respect to, um, you know, this kind of pinch point of, you know, what are these buildings worth? Uh, you know, do they cost more or less or the same to build as, as, as a code house or building works house or building? Uh, you know, and the, the point is that I kind of think I, I agree with what Thomas said, you know, people on the one hand, ideally would be prepared to pay more for something that was better in the same way that they are for 
I think the example you gave was a Land Rover, you know. But having said that, it would be great if things that were better didn't cost more, you know. But th and there's there's no there's no clear winner there. I, th I think you know in, in both cases there's a logic. Um, but I would stress that you know my personal my personal feelings on this are that whatever happens, I just desperately hope that it isn't the contractors that continue to be bashed and squeezed and expected to make things work financially. You know, that's, that's, that's the norm. That's what always ends up happening. If people want things to cost less or be delivered for the lowest possible price and expect contractors to work miracles. And usually a lot of these guys go out of business on these jobs, you know, year in, year out. You know, it's a dreadful, dreadful state of affairs. You know, so people want better buildings, they should be prepared to pay for them, or at least the margins ought to be facilitated somehow by clients and enlightened clients and, and commissioners. But what a fantastic session. It's been great to be part of it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so for me, big thanks to, to Zach and everyone at the Accelerator, to Ulia for all of the hard work, to everyone for attending, and obviously to Tomas. Um, I guess the takeaway for me here is that... Um, it's really interesting to see that everyone is kind of gravitating towards embodied carbon. And that is for me, the that's where we, the, the thing we need to be all talking about. And it, that's gonna change really quickly. I'm seeing um, funds that are building houses be more aware of their social responsibility with regard to embodied carbon. And I've never kind of seen something change that quickly in the industry. So uh, yeah, I think the, the quicker we can get to grips with that, the better. Um, so yeah, overall, thanks to all. Thanks, Hugh. And nice, nice way to wrap it up, Hugh. Everybody, thank you so much. This has been great. Tomas, thanks again. And I hope that everyone will join us for episode two on Thursday, the 18th of November at 2 p.m. GMT. Uh, until then, be well, and thanks again for coming. Take care.